Mills. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on the Greens Fair Work Amendment Gender Pay Gap Bill 2015. And I'll start off by saying that there is absolutely no doubt that entrenched gender pay gaps exist globally, and that includes right here in Australia. But like all complex problems, we need to adopt a comprehensive and evidence-based approach to resolve it, instead of letting um, what I'd call simplistic populism uh, guide us here in this chamber. The gender pay gap is something that I am very passionate about, and I know it's a passion shared by many across all sides of this chamber. But it does require a comprehensive suite of long-term and genuine uh, policy changes to, to really address. Now, this amendment, as proposed by the Greens, would enact changes that will not work and which were not even recommended by the Senate Education and Employment Legislative Committee, which tabled its report into this amendment uh, in November 2016. The very reason the committee did not recommend this amendment is because there is simply no credible evidence that the mandatory removal of pay secrecy clauses will by itself reduce the gender pay gap. Instead, the committee itself recommended that government, employer and industry stakeholders and employee advocates collaborate to actively promote and implement best practice strategies to tackle the gender pay gap in Australia's workplaces. Now, look, I know that the government does understand that the gender pay, pay gap is a complex issue and it is influenced by a number of highly interrelated factors and there are many causes for the gender pay gap, so there can never ever be one effective solution or a silver, silver bullet as those opposite in the Greens purport to be in this case. So that's why this government has adopted a multifaceted approach to addressing equal pay. And I think it's starting to work. It's showing progress because the gap is narrowing. Since 2014, the gender pay gap for average weekly earnings of full-time adult employees has reduced from 18.5 per cent to 15.3 per cent in November of last year, and it fell 1 per cent in the last 12 months alone. Still a sizeable gap, but progress nonetheless. And of course, there would be no one happier than me uh, if it to see it narrow further, which, I'm very, which is why I'm delighted that on the 6th of July last year the government released Towards 2025 an Australian government strategy to boost women's workforce participation. And unlike this amendment before the Senate today, this strategy acknowledges that the gender pay gap is so much more than employees knowing each other's salaries. The predominant issue is not about a man and a woman doing the same job and getting different pay. That does still exist, but I know there's been a lot of work done by the private sector by companies to actually close this gap, to have a look for the reasons for it and to close that gap. And in fact, the Fair Work Act already includes equal remuneration provisions, which enable people to make an application to the Fair Work Commission for an order to ensure equal remuneration for work uh, that is equal or at least comparable. And as I said, there are many companies now across many professions who are actively seeking and taking measures to close this gap within their own firms. But instead, I think this issue is more about women not being able to enter or re-enter the workforce at the same rate and at the same levels as men, often meaning that they have to take lower pay jobs with less opportunity to access higher salaried full-time positions and receiving far fewer promotions than their male counterparts and also earning uh, less of a bonus or a salary increase when they do uh, move up the workplace ladder. The gender pay gap is an issue that must be grounded in discussions about education and employment opportunities, adequate parental leave, affordable and easily accessible childcare and also far more flexible work arrangements, not just for women but also for men. It's also about what subjects girls and women choose to study, what jobs they take and how they are treated in the workplace itself. But it's also about when women and men's uh, domestic lives. Can women take, off, take time to raise their families without jeopardising their careers? But equally, I don't see this as a women's issue. This is equally a men's issue because children today, most children today have two working parents, but yet the burden in most workplaces still falls on the women to take the majority of time off 
and also to take the leave and to undersee all of the other child taking and child rearing activities. The reasons for that are quite complex, but I think it starts here in Australia where we have been so incredibly successful in providing our young girls with an equal opportunity to life. They have the same health outcomes as young boys, the same um, infant survival rates. We educate them well. We uh, bring them up to be so full of confidence in themselves and in their place in this world. In fact, we've done so well is that girls mostly outperform boys now in uh, high school, but also now in university. And in fact, more women now graduate university than men. So I think up to that point, our society has been incredibly successful in uh, bridging that gap between young boys and young girls and to our young men and our young women. But that still seems to come to a screeching halt in many workplaces today because we haven't made the changes and it's not only in terms of policy and regulation at the state and federal government level, it is also culturally and structurally within the organisations themselves that haven't adapted fast enough to ensuring that both men and women who both have children have the same opportunities and the same responsibilities to look after their children and because children, as I said, mostly have two working parents. So it comes back to this point that this is not just a women's issue, it is equally a men's issue or equally a divide, you know, two parents issue. So I th the government does understand the complexities of this issue, and I know it does take them seriously, which is why the strategy I outlined earlier details measures that we are taking, what is already working, and also having a look at additional measures to address the actual factors themselves that drive pay inequality. So what are some of these, what I see as some of the driving factors and what the government is doing and what we all could do more to address? So the first one, the first problem that we need to address is the fact that women are less likely than men to enter and to progress into higher paying careers and seniority. So this is a problem that this government is very clearly tackling. And a great example of the positive action this government's taking is something that I'm very passionate about, and that is women in STEM, or I would like to see us now talk about STEAM, because I think um, encouraging women not only to study uh, science and technology, but also to enhance boys and girls' artistic and creative and innovative uh, sides of their, their character and their abilities is equally as important as STEM. But the fact is that women are less likely to enter high-paying careers, and many today have uh, their foundations in STEM. And in fact, 75 per cent of Australia's fastest growing careers and jobs today demand digital literacy and STEM subjects. However, and alarmingly, the number of girls studying STEM subjects is declining, and women are still significantly underrepresented in fields like information technology and engineering which again are the jobs of the future and they are some of the most high, highest paying jobs and careers in the future. And today overall less than 15 per cent of senior STEM research positions in universities are held by women and women make up only about a quarter of STEM workforces across all sectors. So if we are truly going to bridge the gender pay gap once and for all, we have to redouble our efforts into getting women into STEM, into STEAM positions across all sectors. And the Greens' proposal to share information about what each other gets paid in these circumstances will do absolutely nothing to change those statistics, and it won't ensure that more women study STEM and enter into STEM and their high-paying jobs in this profession. It will not make a difference at all. This government, unlike those in the Greens with this very simplistic populist uh, proposal, believes in a bottom-up approach, something that is led by the individuals themselves in terms of the choices they make for themselves and their children and what they study, and for businesses themselves to actually take more action to create change within their organisations for the better. Now, This is why the government, through the National Innovation Science Agenda, through the NISA, is supporting measures to encourage more women to embark on and remain in STEM-related careers, including, importantly, in entrepreneurship. 
We are implementing strong measures to ensure that women have the skills and the support they need to work in growth industries through the investment of $13 million over five years in jobs in these growth sectors. The government is also providing $2 million to set up a male champion of change for STEM. Male champions of change challenge men in leadership positions to step up beside women to drive cultural change on gender equality issues in major Australian organisations and industry sectors. While we've seen um, a great take-up of this program, particularly in larger private enterprise companies who are making a real difference now in terms of how they deal with both men and women and the opportunities for parental leave and for flexibility is incredibly encouraging. But unfortunately, in a lot of the traditional STEM-related industries and the IT sector, we are not seeing very much movement in that yet. So the, the adoption of the Male Champion of Change programs is critically important in these sectors. Now, the government is also investing $8 million over four years towards uh, projects that boost the participation of girls and women in STEM education careers, as I said, including as entrepreneurs. This first measure that I've gone through is all about long-term change to a quality of opportunity and not a short-term populist fix as proposed by those opposite. So that's the first major barrier to gender pay gaps, that is um, engagement in the workforce and in particularly in STEM. But the second issue that equally impacts on the gender pay gap is a weak economy, which means fewer jobs and demonstrably it shows that in a weakening economy or a, or a weak economy, that women disproportionately are in lower paid jobs with less job security and certainly less uh, superannuation and retirement certainty. So to address this particular problem, the government is not just increasing women's access and readiness for employment in STEM careers, but also more bro broadly across all uh, careers. So let's have a look at what this actually means for women. Our policies since coming to government have strengthened Australia's economy, so much so that nearly 970,000 Australian jobs have been created after four years. That's nearly a million new jobs that have been created, which is something that those on the opposite benches rarely, in fact, never give this government credit for. But that is nearly a million Australians in work. Now, let's have a look at those, those figures a bit further. Nearly 60 per cent of those new jobs created over the last four years, nearly 60 per cent of those new jobs have gone to women. They've been taken up by women. So boosting women's workforce participation is an economic priority for this government. We have to create more new jobs in this economy, which we're doing, but we have to make sure that they are also in industries and in areas that women can and will take up jobs in. And in fact, it's not just the right thing to do for our society, but it's also the economically smart thing to do, because it actually has the potential to add over $25 billion to the Australian economy, while at the same time strengthening women's economic security. So that was the second issue and one of the barriers to clo closing the women's pay gap. But the third one I'd like to uh, raise in this chamber today is the fact that women are still predominantly the primary caregivers for their children, which impacts on their careers, on their salaries and also on their superannuation and their retirement uh, security. Now, as I said, we've done a wonderful job raising our girls and our boys, smart, confident, highly educated, but we have not yet satisfactorily addressed the situation that many women find in the workplace today. We certainly haven't addressed the cultural barriers to men who have young children just <laughs> in the same way that their, their wives do. And we have to change the processes in companies, in organisations, in the public sector to make it equally acceptable and in fact encouraged that both a child's parents will equally take parental leave and not just put the requirement on women, because we know the impact, very well reported, the impact that that has on women themselves and is a significant contributing factor to the gender pay gap. 
So to address this particular aspect, the government is addressing factors that take women out of work and, keeping, and keeps them out longer than their male counterparts, which decreases their path to promotion and it does ultimately lower their pay and superannuation contributions over the, long, over the longer term, which does mean that more women retire with less super, on average about $100,000 in their superannuation fund, and are much more likely to be subject to poverty in retirement. The gender pay gap also often occurs because of a discrepancy, partially caused through this, in the promotion pipeline. If less women work in an industry, there will be start off with less women to promote, but then women are caught in a double bind because if they have also taken time out of their careers to rear their children, they are also then starting from behind under many traditional promotion-based systems in many organisations. Each absence from the workplace lowers their opportunity for promotion and therefore their ability to increase their salaries and their savings, particularly superannuation. Now, much of this particular problem is in fact an issue for organisations, public and private, to resolve in their own workplaces. It is really an issue for leaders in companies to set the standards and to change policies and also practices in their organisations. It is critically important, and I argue that it is great business sense, for a company to create a family positive environment for both their men and their women so that both parents can take parental leave. Both parents feel that it's okay if they need to take time off you know, for sick children, for school holidays, and the assumption and the responsibility doesn't just default to the woman. We also know that uh, affordable and accessible childcare is critical to supporting parents who are balancing uh, and work and family commitments. So that's why we're making childcare more affordable. This government has already made the most significant reforms to the system in over 40 years, and the new childcare package is unashamedly targeted to supporting parents who access childcare to work more, to train, to study or to volunteer in their communities. These reforms in themselves are expected to encourage more than 230,000 families to increase their workforce participation, the majority being women. From July 2018, the government is removing the 7,600 annual rebate cap for families on income up to 185,000. That's 85 per cent of families using childcare. Now that is a good measure, and that is something practical and tangible that can make a difference. And families earning more than 185,000 will benefit from the increased cap from an increased cap of $10,000. The next barrier, the fourth barrier, uh, that must be tackled is something that I have already uh, touched on, but it's the unconscious bias um, that still exists in most organisations. Whether it be public organisations, private organisations, there is still unconscious bias that exists which contribute in that organisation to gender pay gaps. But it's great to see that the government is leading by example by implementing the Australian Public Service Gender Equality Strategy. Now, this requires that every government agency set targets for gender equality in leadership positions and boost gender equality more broadly. We are also, <laughs> cheap shot. We're also setting a target of men and women, each holding 50 per cent of government board positions overall and strengthening the BoardLink program. But there is still much more to the gender pay gap than all of that and so much more that we have to do together. Not all of this change can be led and implemented solely by a single level of government. So much of what causes the gap is cultural and requires a cultural shift, and that's something that only people in individual organisations can do. Federal government can set the path, it can set the example, but we cannot change the culture within organisations, whether they be public, private, large or small. We can lead the way, but we cannot change it on our own. I believe we should close the gender pay gap. In fact, it is a moral imperative for us all. But we need to do things to tackle the four main problems and four main barriers that I've discussed here today. Sadly, the proposal by the Greens 
will impact on neither of those problems. We can work on it together, and we should work on it together. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Senator Thank you. Polly. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President.